Transformation that we find uh, within Kabbalah is very unique because uh, we, get, we, we get a perspective of every time we study the Kabbalah. Kabbalah is, of course, is the, the secret of creation. When God created the world, God created the world and he saw the light that it was good and he, uh, he, uh, he hid it. He hid that light uh, because it was too much for the world to be able to contain. So where did God hide that special light? It was an x-ray vision, vision that you could see through and uh, take on a whole different perspective on light. It was hidden in the Torah and within the Torah was, it was hidden in the, you know, in the parts of the Kabbalah that are the parts of the Torah, which, uh, which are Kabbalah, which is the tradition passed down from generation to generation. And within that, we find the secrets of creation itself. So when you have the creation itself, you have all the secrets and all the remedies and ideas how to live the life, what we were created for. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to stand here for too long. I'll invite my father who came all the way from Buffalo, New York, to share with us some words of wisdom. Thank you, Mandy, Rabbi Emma Greenberg. It's always a pleasure to be here. Very beautiful, warm Jewish community. And uh, my son actually encapsulated everything I wanted to say. So uh, if you want to enjoy the refreshments, <laughs> No, you know, the story of the uh, rabbi who gave his sermon for about an hour. And one of the members came over to him and he said, uh, I just got a job working for CNN, and I'm sh they would really love to have your sermon aired on their special uh, programming. But the problem is they can only do segments of three minutes. Can you condense <laughs> that our sermon into three minutes? And the rabbi said, mm, that's going to be difficult. But getting on CNN, national exposure, he says, I think I can do it. So then why did you torture us for an hour? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Kabbalah is very popular these days. Everyone is talking about Kabbalah. But unfortunately, Kabbalah has been misrepresented by the popular, popular media, Hollywood uh, characters who uh, are using Kabbalah as a way of delving into the exotic, making them perhaps more interesting. And in the, in the process of doing that, a lot of what they're saying distorts the reality of Kabbalah. What I'd like to talk about, first of all, is a little bit of an introduction into what Kabbalah is. Why was Kabbalah always a secret doctrine? And now it's becoming more or less popularized. And how it could relate to us and change, and change, help us change, and help us transform ourselves. As my son just mentioned, when God created the world, he created it with his divine powers, of course. But there's something about the first day of creation that gives us an insight into what God's plan was. On the first day of creation, it says, God said, let there be light. Before that, there was darkness, chaos. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And by the way, we once had a doctor, a lawyer, a, an architect and a politician sitting together and they were arguing which was the first profession. And the doctor said, obviously, we were there first, Adam and Eve, God performed surgery, so the medical profession was the first profession. 
the architect said, well, they had to have uh, infrastructure in order to do uh, to practice medicine. So you needed an architect to design the world. And the lawyer says that there was chaos. Obviously, we are called in to uh, get rid of the chaos. And the politician types up and says, well, who created the chaos? So you have those different professions represented in the beginning of the Torah. But the capitalist is also represented because the very beginning of the Torah, the Torah says, let there be light, and there was light. By the way, you know there are light bulb jokes. The psychologists, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> Did we hear that one? I probably have, but I'm a very the light quiet. bulb has to want to be changed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an old one, but I, I, I don't know two new ones. How many rabbis does it take to change a light bulb? Anyone have an idea? Yes? What? Well, we're pretty close. All the rabbis in the world will never agree as to how to change the light bulb. So it won't help. How many capitalists does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is, you don't need the light bulb. There's the inner light. And that inner light is sufficient. So who needs to change the light bulb? But that inner light was created on day one of creation. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And there's obviously a problem. What's the problem with that statement? That was the first day of creation in Genesis. What kind of light? The sun didn't get put into place until day four. So when the Torah says, God said, let there be light, and there was light, it doesn't just say God said, let there be, there was light, what kind of light was there? And Rashi already quotes this in the Midrash, it's in the Zohar. It's a very uh, well-known statement that, in fact, the light that God created the first day of creation was not sunlight. It was not a physical light. It was a spiritual light. Yes, it might have had physical properties because in Kabbalah we're always told that everything in the physical world has a spiritual counterpart. Everything in the spiritual world has a physical counterpart. Sunlight is a reflection of spiritual light. The spiritual light can be reflected and expressed through physical light. So the first day of creation, you had a unique type of spiritual light. What was unique about it? What were its properties? You were able to see from one end of the world to the other. What does that mean? Right now, we also have the ability to see from one, one end of the world to another. We have television, we have internet, we have uh, Skype. You can be exposed to any view, any place in the world. In fact, not, not only on Earth, you can see into the cosmos, you can see into the most distant galaxies. Google map. Google map, okay. <laughs> what is so special about being able to see from one end of the world to another? And the answer is that it wasn't just a physical capacity to see great distances, it was an ability to see reality the way reality was intended. It was the ability to see things in their entirety, to see the whole picture. And Sefer Yetzirah, that's the first major work of Kabbalah, a very small book attributed to Abraham, the patriarch Abraham, Sefer Yetzirah, the book of creation. It's quoted in the Talmud. It's an ancient, ancient text, and there it divides all of creation into three categories. Olam, which means world or space. Shana, which means year or time. And nefesh, which means soul, life, or energy. Everything in this world is either limited, defined by the space that it occupies, by time, or by its soul, by its spiritual identity by its life and in all of these three areas we have a compromised view of all these three things for example in terms of space when you see an event what do you see take a picture what do you see you see a very small part of space and because you only see a slice of that area, you get a distorted picture. You know there's a famous expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. 
I think that's a very misguided statement. A picture is the most distorting way of presenting something because pictures are never given in their entirety. And I'll give you an example. This is an example I think what goes back maybe 15 to 20 years. I'm not good at remembering the dates. But I think it was in the first intifada, maybe the second one, when the Arabs were trying to put Israel in a very unfavorable light and the media was agreeing, it was going along with them and they were trying to portray Israel as the Goliath and the poor Arabs as the Davids. And how do they do that? There was this, there was this epic photo of a Arab teenager holding a rock in his hand and about to hurl it at Israelis in their tanks, in their, with their machine guns, their Uzis. And that was a very powerful picture. It created a narrative. That's one of the most, I don't want to sound too negative today, but that's a word that I cannot stand, the word narrative. Because what society has come to, to teach us is that there was no truth. There's no reality. My narrative is that the world is round. Your narrative is that it's flat. Okay, you're entitled to your narrative. Let's not uh, impose narratives on one another. We don't believe that there are narratives. We believe there's reality and there's the distortion of reality. And we try to get as close to reality and truth as we can. We're not always successful. We have to admit our limits, but there is reality. So what happens over there in that picture? The narrative was Israel is the Goliath and the Arabs are the Davids. What exactly happened in that picture? Well, the Jewish newspapers published some of them at least, the whole picture. And what did you see in the whole picture? 20 or more photojournalists were crouched all in a one row. It was a staged picture. They probably got this, this Arab kid to come to an area where there were Israeli tanks and machine guns, and they asked him to pose as if he's throwing a rock at them, and they took that picture. It was a distorted view of reality, but the picture was accurate but it was not in context. And that's true about virtually everything that we see physically, literally, and figuratively. Everything we are, is limited to the space that it occupies, and we can't see the entire picture. The same is true with time. We see something happening. Do we know what happened a minute before, a day before, an hour before? Do we know what's going to happen in a day from now? I'll give you an example. There's a very uh, poignant story told I can't remember the one who told the story, but it's, it's a well-known story of someone going on the subway in New York City, and a man comes into the subway, sits down with his little daughter, and the child is carrying on and behaving terribly, running around, screaming, shouting, and really disturbing the, the uh, peace of all the other people riding on that subway car. And finally, one person got so fed up and so disgusted with the ill-mannered father, ill-mannered child, and the father's uh, shirking responsibility that he goes over to the father and he says, do you know how to take care of a child? Why, why don't you control your child? And the father answers, he just came from the funeral of this child's mother. And that changed the whole, the whole scenario. Nothing changed and everything changed because they knew what happened a few hours before. And all of a sudden, this person had a totally different understanding and interpretation of the event. Not that anything changed, but everything changed. And we don't know what happens before. You know the famous analogy, you take someone from a uh, primitive society and you bring them into a, blindfold them, bring them into a room and you see a bunch of masked people with knives in their hands ready to stab someone who's lying on a table and he's ready to stop them, murderers. But of course, if he had seen that this was an operating room, he would know that these are surgeons saving the life of the patient. What was missing there? They could see as well as anyone else. They don't know what happened before. They only see one slice. It's like watching a movie and seeing one scene of the movie and trying to determine what the movie is about and how the movie ends based on that one scene. And I once had an interesting incident, a colleague rabbi in town tells me he met some, someone and this person told him I went to the Chabad house and I never saw such 
depressed people. It was so sad and grieving. There was no life. Everything was so morbid. These are very, very sad people. <laughs> I said, what? I mean, you go to the Chabad house, everyone is smiling, everyone is on Shabbos, they're singing and dancing, and there's so much lively you know, activity there. What kind of impression could he have gotten? What happened? And it turned out he came Tishabov. The <laughs> national day of mourning, Tishabov, when we sit on a low place near the ground and we dim the lights and we say the Book of Lamentations, and uh, it looked like we were a bunch of depressed people. The problem was he came at just the wrong, wrong time. And the same thing could be the other way around. You just come to a person when they're in a good mood, not knowing that they're always very, very foul mood, in a very foul mood. We don't see the whole picture space-wise and time-wise. But you know, the most important thing that we don't see is we don't see the depth of any of the events that we see. When we see something, we only see one dimension we cannot see beneath the surface. There's a subtext. And the subtext has a subtext. And some people are able to see a little bit deeper than the surface. Some people could see a lot deeper. Nobody could see the whole picture in either space, time, or soul. We don't see the soul, the inner depth and meaning of, of things. And you know, the whole the word in Hebrew for world, universe, is olam. What is the root of that word? Yeah. What does that word? Hell means concealment. concealment. The world was created in a way that we cannot see the reality. That is how God created the world. But then the first day of creation, and actually the first week, it lasted until after the first Sh Shabbat, after Adam and Eve had ate, eaten of the forbidden fruit, they were driven out of the Garden of Eden, but for Shabbat they were allowed to stay. And this light, this primordial light, would shine for those 36 hours that Adam and Eve were in this world. Those 36 light hours are symbolic of, the number 36 is, uh, there are 36 righteous people in every generation. Hanukkah, we have 36 candles throughout the entire Hanukkah. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 2, 3, 2, 1, if you add that up, it's 36. Uh, there are 36 tractates of the Talmud. 36 is a number that relates to light. Hanukkah is said to be a glimpse of the light of the past and the light of the future. But at any rate, this light that was created on day one was a light that enabled you to see the entire picture. But what happened to that light? That light, by design, was concealed so that we do not see the entire picture, that we have to search for that light, that we have to search for the true meaning of, of existence. And it did happen. Some people, Abraham, for example, was someone who searched and he searched and he searched and he came to the conclusion there is something beyond. It's the reality of existence is not just what we see. There is something more to existence. You know, grandfathers like to talk about their grandchildren and the grandson when he was three years old. His mother took him to His mother took, took him to the store, bed, bath, and beyond. So as they come to the checkout counter, he looks at his mother, he's very puzzled, he's bewildered, and he says, Ma, I see the beds, I see the baths, where's the beyond? And that's the question that every person has to ask. Where is the beyond? I, I'm not satisfied with the narrative of existence, with the way Existence appears to me with the naked eye or the superficial way of, of thinking. People have to search and delve. Yes, the beds are important, the baths are important, but there always has to be the search for that beyond. And that's what happened until Sinai. We're soon going to be celebrating the holiday of Shavuot. What happened at Sinai? God gave us the Torah. That's not what happened. The Torah was already there before. The Torah was the blueprint of creation. Abraham, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were exposed to the teachings of the Torah. There were many people. Noah, for example, if you read the story in Genesis, God told him to take two of the non-kosher, the unclean animals, and seven of the clean animals. Where, where did he get clean and unclean animals? 
Those are concepts that are only appear later on in the book of Leviticus. Apparently, the teachings of the Torah were known because Torah existed in the very beginning. So what happened at Sinai? God didn't give the Torah for the first time. It was already there. What happened at Sinai was a complete paradigm shift. What happened at Sinai momentarily was, was a tradition that the heavens opened up. Now, what does that mean, the heavens opened up? What that means is that the way we look at existence changed fundamentally. In the prayer of Hannah, the great mother of the prophet Samuel, uh, her songs of praise to God, she refers to God as a God of day oat. What does day oat mean? Day oat means opinions or views or viewpoints. And God is a God of different viewpoints. What does that mean? God is a God of different viewpoints? But one day God is a conservative, the next day he's a liberal, one day he's, he follows this ideology, another ideology. There's only one, there's only one God and one view that God has. So Kabbalah, and especially in Hasidic literature, that took the teachings of Kabbalah and brought them into the, the rational mind, that there are two legitimate perspectives as to how we look at the world and how we look at God. One perspective is called Dat Tachto, the view that comes from beneath. And the other one is called Dat Elyo, the view that comes from above. What does that mean? In all of Jewish philosophical literature, how do, we, how do they refer to creation? Yesh me'ayin. We are created, yesh, something, we are something, created from ayin, from nothing. That's our perspective, that we are the something, we are here, that's a given. But then there is something beyond us, the elusive beyond, the ayin. What does ayin mean? The nothing. It's, it's elusive. It's unknown to us. But we know that it exists. That's a legitimate perspective that God created, that we should see reality through the prism of our own existence. But then there's dat elio, the higher perspective, the way God looks at everything. How does he look at everything? That lemaalah yesh, everything above is yesh, it is something, is exists, it's reality. Ulemata ayah, and everything below is ayin, is nothing. We are the ultimate nothing. We are the ultimate non-existence. That's how God looks at creation. So God created two perspectives. He created the perspective that we have, that we could use our own tools, our own logic, and our own searching to find the reality that goes beyond us. And then there's a perspective that God has. But the ultimate goal is that we should acquire God's perspective, that we should be able to see things the way God sees things, and not the way we see things. That perspective became revealed for the first time since the beginning of creation at Sinai. At Mount Sinai, God said, I'm opening up the heavens that you could start to see things the way I see them. You know, there's a famous teaching in the Torah, and the way it's explained is very, very strange. It says in the Torah, the nation, kol ha'am ro'im et ha'kolot, that everyone saw the thunder. So the Midrash, Rashi quotes this says, Ro'in et hanishma, mishomin et hanireh. They saw the sounds and they heard the sights. They saw the thunder and they heard the lightning. Most people would say it's, what psychedelic drug were they using? <laughs> I remember when I first came to Buffalo in 1972, uh, I came straight out of yeshiva. I was very... Uh, Exposed to a lot of culture shock, being on the <laughs> campus in Buffalo, the Berkeley of the East, as it was called. And uh, when I came to join another rabbi at the Chabad House, I saw he had a sign there inviting the students for LSD and and pot. 
I didn't even know what pot was that time. But I was asking, what does it stand for? LSD is let's start davening. <laughs> and pot is put on to fill it. <laughs> so that was the culture of those days. So when, when people, re I, I remember te teaching this teaching of the uh, Midrash and Rashi, that they saw the, the sounds and they heard the sights. They were saying, well, they were on drugs. They were taking psychedelic drugs. And if it wasn't psychedelic drugs, then what's the point? What does that mean? That they were able to see the sound and hear the sights? What's, what's the meaning of that? And the Rebbe, in one of his discourses, gives a beautiful explanation. And he says, what happened was a paradigm shift in the sense that before Sinai, what is it that people were able to see? What, what do we see with our eyes? literal eyes and our mind's eye. We see the things that come right before us. The spiritual aspects of life, the beyond, we hear about, we read about, and we might gain some grasp of it. But what is our reality that we see? Seeing is a, is a way of describing coming in contact with reality we see the physical world as the reality. That's the default position of existence, the physical world. But then, through the mind, through our thinking, through our probing, we come to the recognition that there's a beyond, there's something above this. So what is that? We see the, the physical, and we understand and hear the spiritual. At Sinai, that was reversed. What happened at Sinai, momentarily, it didn't last. What happened at Sinai was they were able to see the things that are normally heard. That that reality that to us is elusive, to us is the beyond, is the ayin, the nothingness, that became the true reality that they were able to perceive. They saw the things that are normally expressed, that are access accessible to us through hearing. Something that is normally in the distance became the very obvious reality to them. And conversely, the things that are normally heard, the, 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 the things that are normally seen became distant, and the things that are normally heard became close. So they saw the hear things that are normally heard, and they heard the things that are normally seen. But that only lasted for a short period, the time that it took for the, God to give us the Ten Commandments. I don't know how long that took. There's no record if anyone has that it took 10 minutes or five minutes or one second. But whatever time it took, they were exposed to a higher reality. They were able to see the world from God's perspective. They were able to see the whole picture. And then that light disappeared and was contained in the Torah, in all the laws of the Torah, all the commandments of the Torah, all the legalistic aspects of the Torah. And as time progresses, as we refine ourselves through the fulfillment of these commandments, we are able to recapture that original light. Until such time, when the Shiach comes, that light will become the reality forever of all of humanity. Right now, that, that reality is becoming more and more pronounced, even though we don't see it clearly, because if we would see all of the energy, all of the light that we have generated over the ages, we would be overwhelmed with brilliant light and we wouldn't be able to do anything wrong. We wouldn't have any challenges. So while we're generating new energy and the light is becoming more and more a reality to us, we still could deny it, we can still assume that it doesn't exist, but it is becoming the reality more and more. That's what Kabbalah is, and that's why Kabbalah is becoming more pronounced in recent times, because Kabbalah is that part of Torah, that discipline that helps us get a glimpse of that original light, to see the world from a different perspective. Now, Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, differs from all other religious mystical systems. Every religion has its mysticism. Kabbalah is very different. In what way is it different? Kabbalah 
never separated the spirituality from being involved and engaged in the physical world. Kabbalah never condoned escaping the physical world. Kabbalah never looked at the body as something contemptuous that we have to avoid, that it's a necessary evil. In Eastern religions, for example, their notion of reincarnation is that the body is more like a shmata, use a French word. It's more like a, you know, the soul needs a body to express itself, so it uses the body, the body gets worn out, we discard the body, then it comes back with another body. And the body is really not important until the soul reaches nirvana, and that's the end of the need for the soul to have a relationship with the body. Jewish mysticism, especially in, in the Hasidic tradition, because in Kabbalah itself there are different schools, but they all agree on one thing, that the soul and the body are not enemies. Sometimes they may be in conflict, but that conflict is not the ultimate reality of the soul and the body. There's a dispute between Jewish philosophers and Jewish Kabbalists about what is the ultimate reward in the future. Maimonides maintains that the ultimate reward will be for the soul to be reunited with the body in the Messianic age, and we will live a long, productive, spiritual life to the point where we will have achieved perfection to, this, to the extent that a human being could become perfected, and then the souls will all separate from their bodies and live on forever disembodied, souls without bodies. Because that, Maimonides maintains, is the ultimate reward because the soul can gain much more without its entanglement with the physical body. Nachmanides, who was a, I lived about half a century after Maimonides, and one of Maimonides' critics, although he also was his defender, but Nachmanides was known as a Kabbalist, one of the early Kabbalists in the uh, 13th century, and he and all the successive Kabbalistic writings disagreed very stridently with Maimonides' position, and they maintained that on the contrary, the ultimate reward, the ultimate reality will be the soul and the body together. The body is not considered to be just an instrument through which the soul could express itself, and then we get rid of that body and we take another body, but the soul and the body have a relationship. It's like a marriage. You don't get married to a spouse just because you need something from that spouse, then you discard that, oh, that's happening today, you discard that spouse and you get another one. That's not what marriage ideally is. Of course, it happens because the, 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 the relationships don't work out. Well, the soul and the body are together like a marriage. Perhaps there's a, two analogies can be used to describe the differences between Maimonides' position and Nachmanides. One could look at the soul and the body as the relationship between an artist and the instruments through which the artist expresses his or her creative abilities. So let's say the musician needs the piano, the violin, needs the uh, score, needs the uh, lectern, needs uh, the uh, concert hall, the, the acoustics, to help the, the artist, the musician, express his or her creative abilities. But nobody says that the artist is there because of the acoustics, or because of the, the score, because of the lectern, because of the instrument. It's the same thing with an actor. An actor is on stage and has props, has costumes. They contribute to the artist's ability to express his or her creativity. But they are not the real thing that happens in a, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, on stage. What happens on stage is an artist is showing creativity. Well, that's the same way one can view the relationship of the soul to the body. The soul has tremendous potential. The soul is creative, but the soul in paradise cannot express its creativity. It has to have a stage. It has to have instruments. It has to have all of the different props that go along with an artist being able to express his or her art. Same thing with an artist needs an easel, needs a paint, needs all different physical things, but it's really the creative abilities of the artist that are being expressed. So the body is an instrument through which the soul is able to express itself. Because if the soul was only left without a challenge 
that the body in the physical world poses, the soul would never be tested. There's a famous analogy of the king who sends his crown prince to a faraway country where he can live amongst uncivilized people to really teach the son character. So the soul has to be sent away, far away to an uncouth environment, which is our world, so that the soul is able to express its full capacity of spirituality that would never be expressed had it not been sent into this world to be tested. So the body is really the agent through which the soul expresses itself. That's the analogy Maimonides would use. Nachmanides and the Kabbalists probably use a different analogy. Their analogy is the relationship of a teacher to a student. You go to a, to a school, university. Why do they build schools? Why do they build universities? To employ administrators, custodians. They do that. A lot of people wouldn't have jobs if there wouldn't be schools. Uh, teachers, which is a very important couldn't have a school without teachers, but that's not why they build schools, to employ teachers. They build schools to educate children, students. So who is the school for? Not the teachers who know more than the students and who educate the students and who edify the students, but it's for the student. The soul is the teacher, the body is the student. The goal of the soul is there to reveal the body and the physical world's true divine nature. And this is where Kabbalah differs significantly from all other systems of mysticism because Kabbalah insists that God is not spiritual. That is a misrepresentation of God to call God spiritual. God is as spirit, physical as he is spiritual and he is as non-spiritual as he is non-physical. God expresses himself through the spiritual and a person is spiritually uh, stimulated when they have a certain advanced spiritual sensitivity they become aware of God's presence and then they're capable of seeing divinity in everything in the physical no less so than in the spiritual so in Kabbalah the whole world every part of it the physical and the spiritual are all part of God's scheme so capitalists did not separate the spirit from the body. We don't, we don't talk about going away, meditating, sitting on top of a mountain, connecting to God, and detaching ourselves from the physical world. The mitzvot, the physical commandments, are part and parcel of our spirituality. Well, they tell the story of this rabbi who had a very serious problem. He was an alcoholic, and the congregation was slowly finding out about his weakness and the rabbi was concerned that people would discover that he was uh, a drunk, essentially. And uh, one of the congregants wanted the rabbi to confront the reality and you know, own up to his own weakness. So before Yom Kippur, this congregant comes to the rabbi, we'll call him Mr. Schwartz, and he comes to the rabbi and he says, Rabbi, I have a gift for you. What is it? It's a case of fruit liqueur. And, uh, the rabbi is delighted that he had that gift. But the man says, I am giving it to you on one condition, that when you give your sermon, Yom Kippur, for the entire community, you acknowledge the gift. And you say exactly what is the gift that I just gave you. That way the rabbi will be forced to admit that he has a problem and maybe do something to deal with it. So the rabbi gets up in Yom Kippur and he says, I want to talk about gratitude. I have show gratitude to Mr. Schwartz because he gave a donation of fruit and I want to thank him for the fruit and the spirit in which it was given. <laughs> you can't separate the two. You separate the two, it's a totally different story. In Judaism, the two are very much connected. Now what, what does this have to do with transformation? What does it have to do with using Kabbalah to heal us? Ever since Sinai, when the heavens were open, ever since Sinai, when the light, the way God sees things, was revealed to us and given to us the potential to gradually, surely, slowly but surely, recapture that light and that perspective, it's programmed in our soul that we can never make peace with a reality that is not in tune with that true godly reality. 
To make things even worse or better, depending on your perspective, the Talmud tells us that every day there is a heavenly voice that emerges from Mount Sinai and declares to all of the Jewish people, Shuvu Banim Shuvavim, return, you errant children, you children who have strayed, return to me. And the Baal Shem Tov asks, who hears these sounds, these voices? How many people are willing to admit they hear voices? Not too many people will admit to it. And the Baal says, those who hear it don't need it, and those who need it don't hear it. So what's the point? <laughs> so the Baal answered, we all hear the voice, but we don't hear it clearly and directly. What we do hear, the Baal example was, sometimes a person may be doing something that has nothing to do with anything inspirational. It's not a time of crisis. It's not that you heard an inspirational story. But all of a sudden, you're walking down the street, you're doing your job, and you get a feeling of inspiration. I want to become a better person. I want to become closer to the power. It's all right, it's all right. I hope for many more years my grandchildren will interrupt my message. We're delighted. All of a sudden, you get this feeling of inspiration which is probably what you just got. <laughs> and you feel you want to change. And it might be a fleeting feeling and thought that disappears, it dissipates in a few seconds, and you just ignore it as if it never happened. Baal Shem Tov says, when you get that feeling, that's when the soul picks up the voice from Sinai and re relays it from the subconscious to the conscious mind, and you better take advantage of it. Harness it. Do something good right then and there. Whenever a person gets inspiration, don't say, tomorrow I will do something about it. Do something right away. Make a phone call to someone that needs your help. Take some money out of your pocket, put it in a pushka. Say a prayer. Do something immediately. To never let, never waste an opportunity to take advantage of an inspirational moment, because that's when the voice from Sinai emerges. I would like to add to the Baal Shem Tov's example, I don't think the Baal Shem Tov meant that was the only example, when do we hear the sound from Sinai? When does our soul see the light? When a person feels an emptiness in their life, when a person feels a vacuum, when a person gets depressed, when a person is anxious, I, I remember growing up, I'm about 35 years old, I remember when I was young, <laughs> I don't look 35, I know. Not a day over 34. When I, was, when I was young, I don't remember so many people complaining of depression. I don't remember, I lived with my grandparents for five years. I never once heard my grandfather or grandmother say, I'm depressed, I'm anxious. Maybe they kept it inside and they didn't uh, share it with anyone. Maybe it's not, it wasn't reported, and now everything is reported, so we know more. That could be. I'm not going to say that it's not possible. But I think that there is more of depression and anxiety and all the other uh, feelings that people have that, for which they need therapy that is a result of the fact that we are living in very special times. We are at the end of the long period of Galut, of exile. We are on the threshold of redemption, when that light will become revealed. So right now, our soul is, the voice from Sinai is coming out louder and clearer than ever before. Our soul is picking it up, but because we're not reacting to it, not responding to it, we're, we're dismissing the soul's message to us, we feel this emptiness and we don't do anything to fill in the void. So what do we do? We give psychologists, and I have nothing against psychologists, when a person needs uh, professional help, they should certainly avail themselves of it. Judaism was never against using the medical profession, but you cannot treat a person's emotional problems only with medication or with counseling. It has to be coupled with a spiritual message that gives the person's soul some feeling of, of fulfillment. The soul is anxious because it wants to accomplish something. It wants to change the world. It wants to make us closer to God. It wants to reveal that 
light once and for all, and we're not doing anything in that regard. So the soul feels anxiety, we feel depressed, and the more we do to try to distract us from it, it doesn't work. That is where Kabbalah comes into the picture, because Kabbalah, and Torah in general, is the approach that tells us that there is another reality and that we have to try to recapture that light through the study of Torah, through the observance of the mitzvah and the commandments. And that's what helps us transform ourselves. When a person asks himself or herself, who am I? We always answer it in one of two ways. I once heard this from someone, an interesting uh, observation about the difference between Western culture and Eastern culture and the way people view themselves and what life is all about. In the West, everything is about acquisition, acquiring things. Why is it when you go on a plane, what do they put in the pouch? A catalog for you to <laughs> acquire things. They want you to buy, you're a captive audience, buy. We go shopping, the, the whole economy of this country is based on getting people, enticing people to buy things to get more stuff. Eastern culture is about experiences. No one's interested in sitting on a, with a cloth on top of a mountain and meditating. You're not interested in acquisition. You're not into styles. You're not trying to acquire things. You want to experience spirituality. So what did the Western uh, people do? Westerners go to India and other exotic places to acquire experiences. So we haven't really changed. So either you're, you're acquiring physical stuff or you're acquiring experiences. Or you're just experiencing things. Judaism is, has all of those positive elements of ac acquisition. It has experiences. But Judaism doesn't define us by our experiences and doesn't define us by our acquisitions. Judaism defines us by what we do to respond to the call of Sinai and contribute to making this world the perfect world that God envisioned it to be on the first day of creation when he said, let there be light. What are we doing to bring God's light into the world through all of the teachings of the Torah and all of the commandments? That's how we define ourselves. We define ourselves I am here, my purpose, I know what my strengths are, and I have to utilize those strengths to fulfill that mission. That's what defines me. If I have to acquire things in order to do that, I need a building, a synagogue in order to be able to pray, so we acquire a synagogue. If I need to meditate and experience God and spirituality, because that gives me inspiration, then I have the experience also. But the experience and the acquisitions are subordinate to the purpose that we have to make this world a different place. Talking about identi identity, who am I, is a great Jewish philosopher. Uh, I, I want to read what he wrote. His name is Jackie Mason. <laughs> heard of him, great Jewish philosopher. You know, they had Aristotle, Plato, and Jackie Mason. Uh, I'm going to read, but well, not, not with his accent. <laughs> there was a time I didn't know who I was. So I went to a psychiatrist. He took a look at me and said, this is not you. So I said, if it's not me, who is it? He said, I don't know either. So I said, what do I need you for? And he said, together we're going to find who you are. Together we're going to look for the real you. So I said to myself, if I don't know who I am, how will I know who to look for? And even if I will find me, how will I know that it's me? Besides, if I wanted to look for me, why do I need you? I can look myself, I can take my friends, at least they know who I used to be. And then I said to myself, besides, if I find the real me and I discover that he's worse than me, why do I need him for? I don't make enough for myself. Do I need a partner? Back when I was struggling, I would have been glad to look for anybody. But now that I'm doing well, why do I need him? If he's lost, let him look for me. The psychiatrist says, no, 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 no. The search for the real you will have to continue. That's $500. So I said to myself, if this is not the real me, why should I give him $500? Let me look for the real me and let him pay you the $500. What if I find the real me and he doesn't think it's worth 500? And then I said, for all I know, the real me might be seeing another psychiatrist altogether. Maybe he's even a psychiatrist himself. Wouldn't it be funny if 
you're the real me and you owe me $500? I'll tell you what, doctor, I'll charge you $300 and we'll call it even. <laughs> so, we don't have that problem as Jews. We know who the real I is. We know who we are. We know that we're a composite of a soul and a body. The soul was sent into this world with a mission. The mission is to change the way we look at reality, the way we look at the world, and to change the world to conform to God's perspective. We start off first looking for the beyond, from the prism of our own existence, and then through the teachings of Kabbalah, and specifically, but in general, through all the teachings of Torah, we rise to the level of seeing the world the way God had envisioned it at the beginning of creation. If anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to... Uh... Yes, Yeshua. I'd also like to wish Yeshua a happy birthday. Yes. A Yes. You said in the beginning the uh, Kabbalah that is all over the place out in California and other places. I didn't say California. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, you said it's distorted. Is there any light coming from that? Uh, it's a good question. Kabbalah teaches us that every phenomenon has light in it. Even negative phenomena has some light in it. And sometimes the only way we could unleash that light is by using it in a positive way or by getting rid of it, by getting rid of the negative part, by focusing on the negative and saying, don't use Kabbalah the way it's being used, and negating the negative parts of it. That can help unleash that light. But the best way of generating light is by going straight to the source and not having to deal with, you know, I, I think the phenomenon that Hollywood is getting into Kabbalah has a, has a positive side to it in that anything that Hollywood does becomes known to the whole world. 30 years ago, how many people in the world ever heard the word Kabbalah, or Kabbalah, whichever way you want to pronounce it? It's only within the Jewish community, a very limited number of people, even Jews, who even heard of the term. And now it's, it's a household word because some movie star, some uh, pop figure is uh, you know, using it, true, in a distorted way, but nevertheless, it gives people an opportunity to pursue it in the right way if they know there's such a thing before they didn't know that it existed. Right, turn right, Maimonides, interestingly, when he talks about the Messianic age, he talks about other religions that Maimonides writes are obviously a corruption of the Torah. So then why did God allow other religions to exist if they're, if they're false? So he says because they popularized Judaism to the world. They, they popularize the notions that there's a God, that there's one God, that there are commandments, and that there is a messianic age. So how many Jews know about Jewish values from non-Jewish sources? More than those who know it from Jewish sources. So there's some positive, there's a silver lining to everything. But it's important that you know that it's only a lining, and the rest of it is not the whole, not, thing. It's not the whole thing. You have to know how to separate. But when you started talking, you said, um, and God, and there was light, and it was good, and you could s at that point you could see from one end of the world yes. who could only Hashem. Anyone who has access to that light. To that. Right now, it, it, it actually says in I didn't give you the whole quote that God hid that light because He right. saw that the world was not worthy to use that light, that light would be too powerful oh. for the world. Where did he hide it? He hid it in the Torah. And the Kabbalists say that specifically within the Torah itself, he hid it in the Kabbalah, in the Zohar. The word Zohar means light. The story is told that someone came to the Baal Shem Tov, and a woman whose husband disappeared, and she didn't know if her husband was dead or alive, and he was alive, and she couldn't be married unless he gave her a divorce. She was called an Arguna. She, he come, she comes to the Baal Shem Tov, who was known for his miracles, and he opens up the Zohar, and he looks in the Zohar, and she and tells her, your husband's in this and this city, and this and this place. 
So the question was asked by people who reported the story. Obviously, the Balshemtov had powers that average people don't have. Why did he have to open the Zohar and look in the Zohar? And the answer is because the Balshemtov was trying to show that his ability to see things was not some magic, not some hocus pocus. It was the power of the Torah of God. It was God's vision, not his vision. He was not a ma magician. It was God's vision. And where does the light come from? It comes from the Torah. I assume that he could have told him without opening the book, because he had the book in his head. But that was to demonstrate that it's the Torah. It's not through other medium, media. I had always thought of that light as the Big Bang. I had not thought of it as what we had. The Big Bang uh, was probably uh, pretty brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's a physical manifestation of a spiritual light. Any other questions? Hold on. Could you, yeah, I, I got a little confused with the explanation of Maimonides uh, interpretation and not Maimonides. Right. Maimonides said the in the messianic era, the body and soul live together and create wonderful things and live beautifully and everything will be wonderful. But, but eventually the, end, the soul the will end, separate from the body. The end, there will no longer be a need for a physical existence. The okay. ultimate spiritual reality will be the only reality. It will not be a physical world, in Maimonides' words. And he bases it on his interpretation of various passages in the Talmud. Nachmanides, and later on all other Kabbalists, follow strongly disagreed and said that yes the soul does have certain advantages over the body but the ultimate reward the ultimate reality will be the soul together with the body in fact in some Hasidic writings it says that in some respects the body is superior to the soul you need the soul to reveal the body's own superiority it's like the teacher the student doesn't know very much but the student has the potential to be smarter than the teacher. And the only one who can reveal that potential is the teacher. So you need the teacher to get the student to become even greater than the teacher. So that's the same way. The soul is needed to help reveal the true spiritual, I, I, I use the wrong word, the true godly nature of the body. So if someone says, well, in that case, we should worship the body. No. If you worship the body, you're worshiping the part of the body that is not revealed, where its godliness is not revealed. It's like saying, well, if the purpose of the school is for the student, so let's give every kindergarten child a PhD and let the teachers go on vacation. Why do you have to teach? The students are superior. No, no, the student's superiority is only there after the teachers put their whole life into teaching these students, then they can become the things, the ultimate that they are capable of. Just another, yes? I'm sorry. Yes, sure. uh, with this uh, popular, uh, I don't want to call them sect, but movements of Kabbalah, okay, the one in uh, California, <laughs> and even in Israel, yeah. there is always uh, a feeling that uh, they try to separate Kabbalah from uh, Judaism. Yeah. Yes. From Judaism. That, yeah. Judaism. That is what I was addressing. Exactly. That that is two different things that has nothing to do right. with uh, God or with uh, There's nothing to do with Judaism. There's a fancy Judaism. word, antinomian, where you divorce religion from action. Religion is just a spiritual discipline. That's all. There's nothing physical. You don't have to be involved. You don't have to do the mitzvot. And that is contrary to Judaism. It's contrary to Kabbalah. You know, it's interesting. The city of Tzfat in Israel is the center of Kabbalah. Who was one of the greatest Kabbalists? Rabbi Yosef Karo. Rabbi Yosef Karo was also the greatest authority of Jewish law. Now, in the secular world, how many brilliant law professors do you know that are also mystics? <laughs> that are also poets? So many. There's <laughs> tons. It's the mind, the type of mind that you need for the uh, legalisms and, and the, the, the sterile. Uh, legalistic uh, discussion is not the same part of the brain 
the, the right side and the left side of the brain, different parts of the brain, those two don't go together. In Judaism, they do go together. Virtually every great capitalist was, I shouldn't say virtually, every great capitalist was also a great authority of Jewish law and practice. And I can't say the other way around, that every great authority of Jewish law was also a great capitalist because Kabbalah was not taught to everyone. You had to be a special person because Kabbalah had many dangers that were involved. But as time progressed, we evolved in a positive way that Kabbalah becomes more uh, amenable to us and more accessible to us. Had to be over 40 years old. Uh, that was, there's no law that says you have to be over 40. There was a takana that some uh, rabbis made in the aftermath of Shabtai Tzvi that to restrict the teaching of Kabbalah to older people because people were abusing it. Uh, he used Kabbalah and distorted it and misled so many thousands and thousands of Jews because of that. Younger people or older people? Only older people should learn Kabbalah, not the younger people. I mean, but today but it's not. Not today, today it's not. Like, this is way back. We have no, evolved, yeah. and that's why we yes, can now we, learn we, it? Yes, we have evolved. The okay. world has evolved in a positive way. Is it because we are giving more light to the world? Yes, make, yes, bringing, because bringing the, it closer the, Rebbe, to the, the Rebbe has explained this in two ways. Number one, the world is at its lowest point and at its highest point simultaneously. Mm -hmm. If you look around the world, I could stand here for the next two hours and with a smile on my face tell you how wonderful the world is, how many great strides we're making in medical research and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and things that we're doing to help the, the, mm -hmm. humanity and all the good deeds that people are doing, the, the random acts of kindness, the, the wonderful strides and everything, and just talk about that our generation is unprecedented in the good that we have. Then I can come back next week and with a real serious face and with a very, very uh, morose, give you a terrible report of how decadent we are, how low we are, how society has, has lost its understanding of what is, what is proper, what is moral, and, and so much corruption in every part of government and in every segment of society. We can, we can look at the ills of society, and if you look at the 20th century, 21st century is still pretty young, but if you look at the 20th century, everyone will agree it is the best century in history and the worst century in history. More people were, were murdered in the 20th century than in all of history combined. The, the, the three biggest murderers of all time Hitler, Stalin, and Mao Zedong. For some reason, he's still uh, you know, revered in some circles, even including in American, uh, even our even our administration has members who talk about him in glowing terms, which is mind-boggling. He was the biggest murderer in the history of, of the world, uh, and and he, if he could outdo Stalin and Hitler, he must have had some very special talent in that regard. At any rate, it's the worst century of history. And it's the best century of history, life expectancy. People kvetch about, well, the air isn't so clean, and we should have clean air, and this isn't so good, and the food is the, but meanwhile, we're living to 80, 90 years old, when our, our great grandparents, with a clean air, lived to 35, or, or 50, and then they died of infections. So we, we have to see, that we, so that's the same thing is true spiritually. Spiritually, the Rebbe explained, we have the cumulative good of all generations before us. When you do a mitzvah today, you generate light, or you help recapture that original light, if you want to put it in that context. That doesn't go away. That's, that's stored. It's there. And the next mitzvah is on top of that original one. So if you take all of the mitzvahs that everyone has done from the beginning of time till today, we have the greatest amount of spiritual light, by definition. We are the dwarf standing on the shoulders of giants because we have all of their accomplishments plus our own. You know the story of two poor Jews who were talking to both beggars and uh, they were talking about, dreaming about, yeah, if I was Rothschild, I would be richer than Rothschild, one of them says. The other one says, how would you be richer than Rothschild? 
Because I would beg on the side. That's what I would have. So we're like the beggars that we're Rothschild. We have all the wealth of Rothschild, but we also do some begging on the side. We have a little bit extra. So we're better off than our forebears. It's a very funny story. Well, we have, so on one hand, we need Kabbalah, the inner teachings of Torah, more than any other time in history because we're the lowest. And if we don't have this extra surge of energy, if we don't have this boost, we'll lose it. On the other hand, we need Kabbalah now for the opposite reason, because we are the highest generation of history. We are right on the verge of the Messianic age. We have to prepare ourselves. We can't just go cold turkey into a new age with changing of, of the way we look at life. So we have to prepare ourselves now. So we have two contradictory reasons why Kabbalah is becoming more popular. However, I'd like to add a caveat that Kabbalah was written, the text of Kabbalah was written in code language. And that's why Kabbalah cannot be taught, even today, just by taking a translator and translating the writings of the Ari, as some people have done, because it's written in code. And if you translate code literally, you distorted its meaning. If I say uh, it's night now, then it's a simple sentence and it has a simple meaning and you take it for what it's worth. But if I am using a code, night means that the... Darkness. What? Darkness. Well, whatever it is, I, it, it means that you're, 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 right. it's a signal for people to do certain things. If you take it literally, you won't do what you have to do. Code cannot be taken literally. So then, how do we study Kabbalah today? That's why the Hasidic movement, one of the innovations of the Baal Shem Tov and subsequent leaders of the Hasidic movement was to rewrite Kabbalah in language that is not in code anymore. Where you're not reading a code, you're getting the actual concepts in language that is accessible to, to any thinking person. You have to have at least uh, some marginal, some nominal amount of uh, intellect to be able to study these teachings, but it's it's written, that's why when we talk about Kabbalah, I'm using it generically, but if you ask me specifically, do I recommend reading Zohar? No, I don't recommend that unless you have studied Hasidus, the Hasidic teachings, and then you go back to the Zohar, then you'll see how those teachings are there in the code. But to start off with Zohar or the writings of the Ari or the other great Kabbalists, is, and that's what they're doing, that's what the Kabbalah Center and other places are doing, that is problematic because it, it cannot be understood if you just translate the words. You need the... the uh, so what about the, 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 the literal translation of, you know, the, the literal translation of the Torah and the, and the other... Other ways. Is, is that not the same kind of thing? Or no? Well, well see... If we take, let's say, the Torah says that God took the Jews out of Egypt, that has a literal meaning, and we accept the literal meaning as being true. Right. There's also a deeper meaning. So would that be considered code, the deeper meaning, that's or right. no? That, that, well, that's what I'm asking. The yeah. deeper meaning is not apparent, but the literal meaning is, is just, it's important to know the literal meaning. But what I'm asking is, is that be, no but I'm saying the no. deeper meaning to the Exodus, no, would that be considered a code? Like the code of the Kabbalah, I'm trying to no, understand. What I mean by code is that I use language that I deliberately do not want you to take it literally. Right. If, for example, I got all that. I'll give you an example. In the Torah, Torah it says, in the Torah it says, and God descended. Uh -huh. Well, if you look in... Maimonides died for the perplexed. The first section he devotes almost entirely to showing you that all these terms that the Torah uses, and God descended, and God sat, and God stood, and God said, are all terms that cannot be taken literally. So if a person reads the Torah and translates it literally and understands it literally, they distorted the simple meaning. The simple meaning of God descended means that God revealed himself. That's how Maimonides quotes Uncles, the Aramaic translation, the Isgale, and he revealed himself. And the same thing with all the other anthropomorphic terms, terms that are physical, that are attributed to God. The literal meaning is not, the simple meaning is not the literal meaning. 
See, that's the difference between Jewish fundamentalism and non-Jewish fundamentalism. The non-Jewish fundamentalists say, if the text says this, it means this. And the Jewish fundamentalist says, no. It depends on what text you're talking about. If the text is poetry, poetry is not the same as prose. So the simple meaning of poetry is different from the simple meaning of, of prose. Uh, when the Torah uses terms in relation to God, it does the simple meaning is not the literal meaning. So people confuse the two. Literal is a dangerous thing when you take things that were not intended to be literal as literal. By the same token, if you take things that are intended to be literal and you insist that it's only figurative, that's also a distortion. So that's why we have the oral tradition that helps us understand when you take things literally, when you are not supposed to take things literally. Yes? Going back to what you said before, you explained to us why things are very good now. But you did not tell us why things are very bad. In what way are they bad? Why are, why are they are so bad? Uh, you stumped me. I, don't, I have no idea why they're bad. God is the one to ask, not me. I have no explanation for bad things. I can, I can give you an explanation, but it's not a good one. Because no explanation will ever be good enough to justify anything bad. I mean, when people ask, why did God allow you know, the Holocaust? Or if someone asks, why does God allow a little baby to suffer? What answer could we ever feel comfortable with? None. I think anyone who feels comfortable with any answer has to look into their own humanity to see what they are lacking. God could make us feel comfortable with pain and suffering, but he chose to not let us feel comfortable because if we would feel comfortable with pain and suffering, we wouldn't care. I, I once heard this beautiful analogy. You're walking in a hospital and you're walking down the corridor and you hear someone crying out of terrible pain, and your heart melts. You feel such empathy for that person. People don't like to hear someone's in pain, and it just breaks you, crushes you. And then five minutes later, you're walking down another corridor of the hospital, and you hear someone screaming from pain. And you give a little smile, even. It doesn't bother you. What's the difference? What happened? <laughs> What? One was a birth? The second corridor was the maternity ward. Right. You heard a woman giving birth, crying out from pain. Is her pain less than the other pain? No. Different. But why don't we feel as bad about it? <laughs> because we, in our mind, it's a good pain. Look, it's a new child is born. Mazel tov. So we're able to rationalize that pain, and because of that, we don't feel the pain as much, or even at all, depending on who you are. The husband probably feels it, the father feels it, the, uh, but the, the stranger will, will feel terrible pain here, and here will say, oh, it's, it's, it's going to last a few minutes and then everything will be, will be uh, hunky-dory. And even the mother will forget about it. Right. One thing I don't understand, though, is why it was dangerous. Is, do, like, is there any, like, you why said... Why is Kabbalah dangerous? No, it was, you're saying. Now it it's not as much, but it back then you said... It could be it's distorted. Why is it dangerous for many reasons? Number one, it's I mean, back then, it's written in code, and therefore it can be it can be distorted very easily. Number two, Kabbalah, because it focuses so much on spirituality, and it awakens certain soul powers, it can generate such power and such energy that people will use it to escape reality. And there have been stories in the Torah itself where Nadav and Avihu, Aaron's two sons, bring this offering and they die. And the way the commentators explained that, that they had such a passion for God, they were so on fire, their souls were on fire, that they just wanted to expire. And there were many stories throughout Jewish history of Kabbalists who died because they went too, they went too high. And then Kabbalah, again, it goes back to the first point, I'll give you an example where Kabbalah was distorted and horrible consequences. Shabbatai Tzvi, and later on the Jacob Frank, who was another false messiah, took one of the concepts of Kabbalah and distorted it, and in doing so, introduced so much evil into the world. 
There's a concept in Kabbalah that the higher something is, the lower it falls. That means that everything in this world has spiritual energy in it. The lower something is, the more spiritual energy it has. Well, what does that concept mean? That if something is evil, it has a lot of power in it. Well, they took it another step further, that God wants us to do evil things because there's so much spirituality in evil. And they began doing things that were immoral and horrible things. When was this? In the 17th century, oh. 17th and 18th century. This was a group of people who followed the teachings of Kabbalah, but they distorted, they distorted it. What it really means is that there are certain sparks of holiness that are embedded in everything in this world, and the lower something is, the more those sparks are more powerful, but the more inaccessible they are. And the only way you can release those sparks is by shunning the evil. That's how we release it. When you, when you, when it, why is it that people are attracted to things that are negative? Because there's a tremendous amount of power, spiritual power. How do you neutralize that, the, the negativity, and how do you get the, the spiritual power by resisting it? Every time we resist doing something that we want to do that is not right, we become much more empowered. It energizes us even more than doing a positive act. That's the idea in Kabbalah. But they took it literally, that the lower something is, the more disgusting something is, the holier it is. And therefore, we should be dis doing disgusting things because that's the way we get closer to God. That's, that's an example. And they used it. When Shabbat Tzvi flouted Judaism in many different ways, they said, ah, he's going down into the lowest levels to re release those sparks. And when he converted to Islam, they said, oh, that's, he's still a Mashiach, but he has to go down into the, into the lowest level and to release the sparks from there by, by converting to another religion. Uh, and he had followers. A hundred years later, there were still some people who believed in that nonsense. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom, shabbat shalom, shabbat